I will praise you, O God, with all my heart. I will tell of your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. My enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you, for you have upheld my right and my cause. You have sat on your throne judging righteously. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name for ever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken the enemy. You have uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord and throw it in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. For he who avenges blood remembers. He does not ignore the cry of the afflicted. O Lord, see how my enemies persecute me. Have mercy and lift me up from the gates of death that I may declare your praises in the gates of the daughter of Zion and there rejoice in your salvation. The nations have fallen into the pit they have dug. Their feet are caught in the net they have hidden. The Lord is known by his justice. The wicked are ensnared by the work of their hands. The wicked return to the grave, all the nations that forget God. But the needy will not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted ever perish. Arise, O Lord, let not man triumph. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Strike them with terror, O Lord. Let the nations know they are but men. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is life and truth. We thank you for this new year, and we desire to know you better and love you more. We pray this morning that by your spirit you would bring this passage of your word alive. Father, help me to be faithful in preaching it, and help each one of us to listen for that quiet voice which speaks wonderful truth. Help us to hear and obey, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was asking at the beginning of our service this morning, what's one thing you could do this year to increase your enjoyment of God? And uh, I think Raymond was saying, well, one thing that he's going to do is is be faithful in reading the Bible. And you might like to join him after morning tea this morning to read the Bible, to increase your enjoyment of God. Praising God is an excellent way of increasing your enjoyment of God. And there are many good things that we can praise God for, for life and health and happiness But one of the best reasons of all is when God saves you and you can praise him for it. And this is David's motivation for praising God in our psalm today. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders, he says. You see, when King David wrote this psalm, he'd been through some very troubling times. It seems that strong enemies had risen up against him. The nations had declared war against Israel and against him as their their king. It seems that people were dying, that innocent blood was being shed. And even King David felt like he was standing at the gates of death, as he says in verse 13. It must have been a scary situation. Things must have been quite desperate in the midst of these challenges that he faced. You see, this is real. Psalm 9 is a salvation song and it teaches us real reasons for trusting God as we live in uncertain times. It sings to us about our trustworthy God, reminding us that he can be relied upon in uncertain times. For our God is, as the kids talk just proclaimed, a strong refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. 
And that's why it seems to me Psalm 9 is a great psalm for us to start the year with. It really is. Because I actually do think that there will be trouble ahead in 2019. I'm not sure how you see the year unfolding. But it seems to me we really do need to be reminded and to know that our God is in control. That our God is a God of refuge for the oppressed and that those who trust in him will never be disappointed, which is what David declares in verses 9 and 10 and gives the title for today's message. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you, O Lord, and isn't this wonderful, for you, O Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Well, there's comfort there, isn't there? What should we do in times of trouble? It's a serious question. What do you do in times of trouble? Where do you run when you need to feel safe? Attitudes are changing rapidly in Australia at the moment, aren't they? Our freedom for faith is being undermined. Last year we came within five minutes, literally five minutes in the Australian Parliament of losing our freedom to teach passages that are consistent and faithful with God's word, such as Romans chapter 1 and others. As the new year begins, it's not hard to see that troubling times are ahead. I expect the following battlegrounds will become prominent in the current year. Schools, aged care centres and other Christian institutions will lose their exemptions from anti-discrimination laws on religious grounds. Activists will try to force the issue by bringing court cases. School scripture will come under renewed attack. Safe schools material will be put back into our curriculums. Gender theory will be pushed hard along with compelled speech in the workplace. Abortion laws will be further liberalised. Euthanasia will become a hot topic. And my guess is that we'll end up with a religious freedom commissioner, an Orwellian role if ever there was one, someone whose job it is to protect religious freedoms. But you know, we already have commissioners for race discrimination, sex discrimination, disability discrimination, age discrimination, child safety, Aboriginal justice, human rights... Oh, these people are not our friends. They exist only to make politicians look good and sweep the problem off to someone else. And in the name of freedom, they take it away. So there are troubling times ahead for God's people, not only in Australia but around the world as well. I know it's particularly in places like China, Nigeria and the Middle East, just for starters. But Psalm 9 teaches us not to be surprised when the world rebels against God. It teaches us not to be surprised and not to panic. Our God is righteous. Our God is good. And our God is in control. So that whatever happens, happens because he permits it. And his purpose is to bring some glory to himself in and through the midst of it, even if it's in the process of judgment. And so we can trust him with our lives and you can trust him to avenge the blood of the innocent because that's the kind of God he is. You can trust God to hold the wicked to account. Eventually they must stand before the throne of a holy God and explain their actions. And who will they appeal to if they seek forgiveness if they don't have Christ? Meanwhile, as we live in a broken world and with troubles ahead, you and I can trust God to be a refuge for the oppressed so that we do not need to be afraid. My first point for this morning looks at how David praises the Lord. He sings a song to God even in the midst of troubling times. 
what's obvious from the start of Psalm 9 is that David loves the Lord and the Lord loves David and this is a living relationship and it's full of warmth and trust and there's communication going on so that David is free to speak to God both about his challenges and his fears on the one hand as well as his joys and blessings on the other. He tells his heart to God. So in verse 1 again, we come back to verse 1. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I'm going to put everything of me into this. I will tell of all your wonders, the amazing things that you have done. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Can you feel the thrill of his heart? Can you get into the passage and the, and the sense of emotion that's here as he recalls the good things that God has done in the past and in the present? I will tell of all your wonders. What wonderful things has God done in your life? If I can paraphrase what David's saying here, he's saying, I will tell the old, old story of God's love for his people and for me the wonders of his faithfulness, the wonders of his love. And so he begins the psalm in this wonderful, uplifting note. And this is how David would have praised God, it seems to me, by reading God's word, the Bible. He would have done praising God by reading God's word, by sharing stories of salvation and testimonies that would encourage people and by singing because it's a song, isn't it? Psalm 9 is a song. And he would have told people in these different ways how wonderful the Lord is, how truly wonderful the Lord is and how he'd led the people in the past through the Red Sea, how he'd made a covenant with them at Mount Sinai, how he'd given given them his word that they might live by it, how he judges the wicked, how he saves the righteous, how he defeats enemies, how he forgives those who turn to him and how he protects us from evil. And it's good for us to remember these things too as we face uncertain times and to recall God's kindness in our lives too. What has God done for you that you should praise him with all your heart? Even if you're in the midst of trials and tribulations, if you take your eyes off those and look at God, what has he done that you can praise him for? Well, let me give you some ideas. First, he's called you by name. And if you've run from him, then like the prodigal son, he's waiting there for you to return. And as you return, he'll run to you and embrace you. He's taken your punishment, the punishment for your sins, in his own body on the cross. He's given you a new life and a new future. He sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within you so that you too can have that personal relationship with God. He's given you a local church to belong to and to serve in. He's taught you of his ways and now he is leading you in the paths of righteousness. Think about it. What recent experiences have you had of God's kindness, God's wisdom, God's grace. Perhaps a prayer answered. A sickness healed. Courage to face an uncertain future. A fear overcome. A soul saved. A word of encouragement from a friend or just a scripture reading for the day. Thankfulness is an important part of faithfulness in a believer's life. Let me say that again. Thankfulness is an important part of faithfulness in a believer's life because if you know the God whose desire it is to bless and encourage his children as a father, then there should be reason in your life if that relationship is healthy where you can think of things that God has done for you in the past or in the present that you can thank him for. And that's part of the reason why I want to restart that written prayer diary I was talking about because it will help me to be more thankful to God than I've been in the past year or so. Thankfulness is an important part of faithfulness 
in a believer's life and it adds to your enjoyment of the Christian life. When God blesses you then, thank him for it. It's something we can all do, isn't it? When God blesses you and you recognise it, take a moment, stop and pray a little prayer of thankfulness to God. Don't take it for granted. Be thankful. You know, the mercies of the Lord are new every morning and his generosity is a great corrective to the idol of selfish love that's so prevalent in our world today. Psalm 9 is simply David's way of saying, thank you, Lord, for the kindness that you've shown toward me. And I want to share this with your people. I want to share this in a song. And here it is. When his enemies were about to triumph, he cried out to the Lord and the Lord delivered him. When he was weak and oppressed, he cried out to the Lord and the Lord saved him. When he was faced with many troubles and he cried out to the Lord, the Lord rescued him and set his feet upon a rock. So my second point for today is called a warning to God's enemies. A warning to God's enemies. I'm looking now at verses 3 to 10 of Psalm 9 in which David declares God's reign as the one who establishes his throne for judgment. And honestly, why would you want to make an enemy of God? It's not good to be on God's bad side, is it? If I could put it that way. Not good to be an enemy of God. People think they can defy God, mock Christ, do as they please and get away with it, but they're wrong. One day, each and every one of us here today will be judged by a righteous judge. And notice in verse 3 how deeply impressed David is by the suddenness of the downfall of the enemies of God. In his own experience, he says in verse 3, My enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you, for you have upheld my right and my cause, you have sat on your throne judging righteously. This is no mere theory, is it? This is living reality. And David is wide-eyed with astonishment at how total and rapid this reversal has been. His enemies have vanished before his eyes. And it's so good, it's scary. Verse 5, you have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken the enemy. You have uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished. Sometimes God does judge suddenly and decisively. I remember there was a a friend once who had a very troubling neighbour who was actually causing them to be afraid in their own homes. This neighbour was a very troubling and violent person and as we spoke about it, we prayed together that God would so, so work in that person's life as to take away the threat that he represented to their family. And within a week, that man was dead. The man said to me, what did you pray? <laughs> Sometimes God's judgment comes just like that and wakes us up to the danger that we ourselves may be in. So David's voice is full of reverent awe. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Only God could do this. Only the righteous judge who judges the world in righteousness could bring about this outcome. The power of God's justice is something to behold. And we should pray that God will have mercy on those who live as enemies of the gospel today. We should pray that God would send a spirit of revival on our land and we should pray that we might be found faithful in our generation as we live in uncertain times. Today the world still lives in rebellion against God and there are those who are hell-bent on destroying the church, like Xi Jinping in China. His hatred of Christians is coming out with a chilling ferocity at the moment. One Communist Party member said the Chinese people should hate Christians because seven out of nine nations which humiliated China in the past were all Christian. Well, there is some truth to the accusation, sadly. But the conclusion that Christianity is to blame is ridiculous. In China today, it is forbidden to preach about the resurrection of Jesus. It is forbidden to preach about the second coming of Christ. It is forbidden for children to become Christians. It is forbidden to preach against abortion. 
It is forbidden for churches to give out tracts or to evangelise. It is forbidden for churches to print Bibles. Did you realise that that was the freedom that they have in China? The freedom to acknowledge the Communist Party as Lord of the Church. In Xi Jinping, we trust, seems to be the motto. Laws like this actually reveal the fear behind them. They are an attempt to suppress the truth. I say Xi Jinping is in denial about God's rule and God's judgment and he needs to repent and receive Jesus as his own personal Lord and Saviour. Christians in China today are under attack. But praise God, they are standing firm. In a letter signed by over 100 courageous ministers, one paragraph says this, For the sake of the gospel, we are willing to suffer all external losses brought about by unfair law enforcement Out of a love for our fellow citizens, we are willing to give up all of our earthly rights. That's courageous faith. That's what Psalm 9 is talking about. I have on the next slide, if we can bring it up, Just a picture of uh, the minister of the early Rain Covenant Church who was recently arrested and uh, various things happened there. In a continuing crackdown on Christianity, Chinese officials detained the pastor and about 100 members of the early Rain Covenant Church, a prominent Protestant house church in Chengdu, Shitsuan. Before the raid, church members' social media accounts and online discussions were blocked. The church's phone list was cut and leaders' homes were ransacked. According to reports, police confronted members overnight trying to force them to sign a pledge to stop meeting. That's freedom in China. It's just like Jesus said long ago to his disciples, if the world hates you, remember it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world and that is why the world hates you. Let me read it again. If the Communist Party hates you, remember it hated me first. If you belong to the Communist Party, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the Communist Party, but I have chosen you out of the Communist Party. That is why the Communist Party hates you. Jesus saw it coming. In troubled times, you and I, my friends, must look to Jesus and we must see him seated at the right hand of God Almighty, reigning forever and ever, fulfilling verse 7. The Lord reigns forever. He establishes his throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. And isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we need? A government that judges, that rules with justice. And then in verse 10, notice, we have one of those inconvenient truths that God's people have always found to be completely dependable and true. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Amen. Let Satan do his worst. He will not prevail. God will always be a refuge for the oppressed and a stronghold in times of trouble. And this truth has been a source of great comfort for God's people throughout the ages whenever evil raises its ugly head. So my third point today brings me to a victory song in which you will find some surprisingly strong words for God's people to sing. Strong words for God's people to sing. In verses 11 to 20, David doesn't hold back, but he gives voice to the emotional release of the afflicted who have received justice and are now witnessing their enemies being led away to the cells. Verse 11. Sing praises to the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. For he who avenges blood remembers. He does not ignore the cry of the afflicted. God always investigates bloodshed and murder. So when, for example, Cain killed his brother Abel way back in the beginning of Genesis, 
God said to him, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? You know that passage? But God investigated that shed blood of Abel. And now we have Christ whose blood proclaims a better sacrifice still that can cleanse from all sin and unrighteousness. These verses teach me that God's justice is a beautiful thing. God's justice is a beautiful thing. We shouldn't be ashamed to talk about it. Rather than suppressing the truth, we need to stand up and say, the Lord is known by his justice. He who avenges blood remembers. He does not ignore the cry of the afflicted. And there is strong comfort here for those who are living in troubled times. The afflicted are especially those who are afflicted for their faith the humble afflicted, the afflicted church. And the world needs to hear that God does remember and he will call to account every evil deed, including those that we ourselves commit. So he mustn't be proud or arrogant about this. We all stand in need of a saviour. But a day is coming when Jesus will judge the world in righteousness and every evildoer and unrepentant sinner will be brought to his or her knees in the presence of our holy God. Perhaps someone will blame God. God's not fair. No, as I said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But there is hope for those who cry out to God for mercy, just as David does in verse 13. O Lord, see how my enemies persecute me. Have mercy and lift me up from the gates of death, that I may declare your praises in the gates of the daughter of Zion and there rejoice in your salvation. Notice here there are two gates, two futures, two destinies, two choices. One gate is dark with terror. One gate is bright with hope and joy. The gates of death lead to destruction. The gates of Zion lead to eternal life. But to get there you have to be lifted up by a saviour to bring you from one place to the other. For the gates of Zion will only open to those who are friends of the king. The gates of Zion will only open to those who are friends of the king. Are you a friend of King Jesus? Have you made your peace with him? Have you asked him to lift you up from the gates of death to the gates of the daughter of Zion? Have you chosen him? I hope you have, for there are many who live as enemies of the gospel today and if that's you, God will find you out. God will find you out. Well, another thing about God's justice and the way that it works is that he often does it by turning the schemes of the wicked back upon themselves. And we see this, don't we, verse 15. The nations have fallen into the pit they have dug and their feet are caught in the net they have hidden. The Lord is known by his justice. The wicked are ensnared by the work of their own hands. And then those words there, Higayon, Selah. These words are special markers in the text and they urge us to stop and think about what we've just read. How does God turn these things around so that people who hate him and do things to destroy the truth are caught out by their own deeds and by their own hands? Such is the folly of fighting against God. How stupid can you be? Why do you want to make God your enemy? Why are you fighting against the one who is ready to save? Why would you do that? The good news that's in Psalm 9, it's the gospel, is that it's never too late to hit the reset button and say, I surrender, Lord. I got it wrong. You're God. I'm not. So in verse 17... The wicked return to the grave, all the nations that forget God, but the needy will not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted ever perish. The wicked will perish, those who refuse to turn to God and be saved, but the hope of the afflicted will never perish. You see, if the world was a perfect place today, then you wouldn't need Psalm 9, but the world's not a perfect place. Bad things happen to good people and all the rest of it. 
Well, Psalm 9 is a corrective to that wishy-washy view of God's love that says that everything will work out in the end and we'll all be happy. No, there is a choice and there is a decision. There is a God of judgment and righteousness and truth with whom we must deal. Psalm 9 sets before us today the reality of God's righteousness. It teaches us that there is judgment, but also that there is salvation. There is hope. It's a word of warning, but it's a call to be saved, to get into that stronghold, which was in our kids' talk today, to be on the inside and not the outside, to be where there's light and hope and safety and not judgment and death. Our God is a righteous judge. His judgments are always just. His rulings are always right. So David finishes the psalm on a confident note in verses 19 and 20. Arise, O Lord, let not man triumph. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Strike them with terror, O Lord. Let the nations know they are but men. Just as we saw last week, that word for men or man is the word enosh. It's the word of humanity in their weakness. Weak, fallen, sinful, rebellious humanity. Arise, O Lord, let not that kind of humanity triumph, but rather let the nations know that's exactly who they are. It's not who they need to be. They need to come to Christ and receive the cleansing and renewal that only Christ can give. But it's strong language, isn't it? Strong language. Strike them with terror, O Lord, so that they might run to your love. It's good to sing judgment songs to remind us of our righteous judge, just as we did this morning as we began the service. The clouds of judgment are gathering, the king is coming. The wicked will not escape. Arise, O Lord. Let man not triumph. That's the song we need to be singing today. Not aggressively or arrogantly, but humbly and hopefully, knowing that God will do what is right. And our fellow Christians in China, they will be blessed when we sing Psalm 9 with them when we join our voices in their suffering. That for the sake of the gospel, we may be willing to suffer all external losses brought about by unfair law enforcement. And that out of a love for our fellow citizens, we may be willing to give up all of our earthly rights. Are you prepared for that kind of future in Australia? And if a little bit of holy fear is needed to wake us up from our spiritual slumber, what's wrong with that? I think it might do us a great deal of good. So then let's finish with some lessons from Psalm 9 today as we begin the new year, 2019. First point is don't be naive. Don't be naive about the spiritual battle that we are in. And when people reject you, or speak hatefully of Christ when Christians, remember that they're actually rejecting God. Meanwhile, it's our duty to be Christ's ambassadors, to warn people of God's judgment and offer the hope of forgiveness in the gospel. We are to stand in Christ, even to the death if necessary. Don't be naive. Second, don't be afraid, because perfect love casts out fear. Whatever troubles you face, you know that God is walking with you in them. Faith always clings to the promise that God will never abandon his people who trust in him. God will never abandon his people who trust in him. No matter what 2019 brings, remember your God is in control and he has put you on this earth for a good purpose 
And there's never been a better time to be a Christian. We have work to do. Good works which God has planned and prepared in advance for us to do. So don't be afraid. And thirdly, do fear God. Don't be naive, don't be afraid, but do fear God. For the gates of death are open and only Christ can rescue you. As Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and then can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after the killing of the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Don't be naive. Don't fear men, but do fear God in that righteous sense of having respect for him and his authority and his power as your creator. I don't know what 2009 will bring. I'm not a prophet, but I expect troubled times ahead. We are in the midst of a spiritual battle and until Christ returns, we must continue to trust God and to do good. Like the Apostle Paul in our responsive reading this morning, we must place our lives in God's hands and believe that he will rescue us. I finish with the words of Hebrews chapter 13 verses 15 and 16 as a take-home thought today. Therefore, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Well, there's a good thought for the year ahead. Let me read it again. Therefore, through Christ, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name and do not forget to do good and to share with others for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word to us this morning. Thank you for the new year and the opportunities it offers us to serve you. Help us not to fear or to become angry or discouraged in uncertain times but to renew our hope in you. Thank you for the promises that you set before us in your word today and help us to keep trusting in them. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, we're going to sing.